Chapter 14. Bonus Content. An answer to the omnipotence of the state. There is little doubt that the state, the institution whose sole function is to legitimately coerce and inflict violence upon others, makes a dangerous enemy. One must only look at certain events of the 20th century to verify this fact, although a look at the entirety of human history would paint a similar picture, give a human being a position of great power, and inevitably they will become the worst type of dictator in short order. Give thousands upon thousands of these men and women parasitic positions, and you will have an entire institution of megalomaniacs. Therefore, when examining the scope of human history, it's no surprise that many have a tendency to deify the state and give it godlike characteristics, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Well, it's understandable. I will argue that this sort of mindset is not only unproductive for self-liberators, but that it is also untrue because the state is largely incompetent. It's unproductive. When it comes to self-liberation and alternative lifestyles, individuals in the statist servile society, and even some anarchists too, seem to always come up with an endless list of why such and such lifestyle is unpractical, unrealistic, unaffordable, crazy, downright stupid, or whatever. Considering the practicality of some of these lifestyles, it would seem to be the case that this reaction is a subconscious defense mechanism. Because, let's face it, human beings do inherently want to be free, but they tend to place as many barriers in the way as possible. Some people love their chains. Some need them. And folks like me are eleutheromaniacs. Maniacs for freedom. It reminds me of an article by Paul Rosenberg titled Nine Reasons People Fear Freedom from his book, A Lodging of Wayfaring Men. The first item on the list is fear of responsibility, and rightfully so. He writes, Freedom is threatening because it eliminates the possibility of shifting responsibility for your errors onto others. Freedom puts you right out in the open with no cloak for your mistakes. It also gives you full credit for your successes but that is seldom considered as the fear-based impulses are generally stronger. To be free means to accept personal responsibility for your life and your actions. That prospect is daunting for many who have become brainwashed and propagandized to depend upon the state. Similarly, I think this is another reason why some anarchists will elevate the state to this godlike status. Theists argue that God is here, has always been here, and will forever be here. So, if the state has been here forever and will continue to be here into infinity, then why the hell would we even try to fight it? Why even try to escape? Resistance is futile. Even if the above were true, that mindset is abhorrent and unproductive. It's a retreat to apathy, it's an excuse for laziness, and it really eliminates most of the purpose from a self-liberator. If you will forever be a slave, regardless of the actions you take, is life really worth living? Maybe, but that sounds a bit depressing to me. For those who are freedom-minded, but more so philosophically, i.e. Murray Rothbard, this sort of deification of the state leads them to believe that freedom can only happen in the long run, after enough minds have been changed. I can't be free until everyone else is free! With this controlled schizophrenia still largely intact, backsliding into political crusading is quite typical. Ah, oh, Murray. Unfortunately, though, this mindset is quite predominant in the anarchist and libertarian community today. A bunch of people trying to philosophize their way to a free society. That alone will never be enough. Theory and action are a necessary duality. This is the role Vanu plays in the creation of a freer future. As Rayo said in Vanu, Book 2, Letters from Rayo, we may still have some contact with that society, but we won't have to worry appreciably over what idiotic thing the people molesters do next. Any more than somebody who takes a vacation at the Riviera now and then needs to be much concerned about the politics of France. Our change in lifestyle will be, in a sense, an answer to the omnipotent of state line of Rothbard and Hess. We will answer not in words, but by doing the only real way. The state is largely incompetent. Even the things the state is best at, it is still 
incompetent at one degree or another. Take theft and lying as the state's most effective aspects. Theft. In 2013, the size of the underground economy was estimated at $2 trillion, or $500 billion in unpaid taxes. The large majority of these folks will never have any run-ins with the IRS. Reason being, there are 10,000 IRS agents attempting to collect from 122 million American taxpayers. Lying. Now, obviously, dishonesty is a requirement for a state to hold and control any perceived legitimacy. If the modern state was 100% open with the way the system operated and why, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning, to quote Henry Ford. And of course, they are incompetent at this. There are continuous leaks from former employees and contractors. Hackers have been known to infiltrate their systems. They could try to keep things secret, but the truth always seems to find its way out. So they're quite incompetent, even at the things they are best known for doing. Conspiracists have a tendency to deify and bolster the state. For every single school shooting, bombing, or other terrorist attack, there is no shortage of individuals ready to claim that X, Y, and Z events were not successful false flags, perfectly orchestrated by the state. Now, I'm not saying there aren't real false flags. There certainly are, and I've dug into quite a few in the past. What I am saying is that the state is probably more than happy to have some folks tossing blame their way for these events. If the perception is that they can orchestrate the Sandy Hook shooting and get away with it, fear and consternation are likely emotions, meaning they get to stay in power. Therefore, it is no surprise that conspiracists often get stuck in the minarchist cage, rarely discussing solutions outside of politics. If the state now has the attributes of godlike power, and if it will be here forever, then the best we can hope for is a return to a smaller size. Let's also consider the fact that 99% of government programs are complete and utter failures, at least when taken into context with the stated goal, i.e. war on drugs, terror, crime, poverty, the United States Postal Service, the Department of Motor Vehicles, just to name a few. Oh, the law of unintended consequences, that dreaded economic principle, that despicable central planners can never escape from? Do any of these things sound akin to godlike characteristics? I don't think so. So yes, the omnipotence of state line of Rothbard and Hess is riddled with issues. First, it's unproductive. And second, the state's largely incompetent, even at the things it does best. Is it still a dangerous enemy? You bet your ass it is. And self-liberators should not ignore this fact. Rather, they should acknowledge their enemy exists, learn its strategies and tactics, develop lifestyles to defend oneself against the threat of coercion. And that's what Vanu is. It's a coherent philosophy and strategy, and it is your tool for self-liberation. Yes, Rail, you're exactly right. We will not answer in words, but by doing the only real way. Pursuing Vanu, handling objections from the servile society. One reason why Vanu is such a radical freedom strategy is that it requires individuals to drastically alter the lifestyle they have been living. Most folks are not willing to do that, and therefore the instinct, it seems, is to try to tear down and convince the self-liberator otherwise, that they should be thankful for being born here in America, and that they are blessed to be able to pursue the American dream. Of course, I believe jealousy is a major part of that, if I can't be free, he or she can't either. Just more examples of the horizontal social control, or in other words, slave-on-slave -slave violence reinforcing the state and the statist servile society. What advice would I posit for dealing with this? First off, don't let the criticisms or expectations from those in the first realm affect the plan you have for the pursuit of Vanu. In other words, don't feel guilt, shame, or whatever for living a lifestyle not approved by those in the servile society. If you're a van nomad working a few half days a week, making little enough to not be liable for income theft, an individual may try to guilt you by accusing you of freeloading off the system. You know what I say to that person? Pardon my French, but fuck you. I didn't choose to be born here. I didn't set up this system, and I sure as hell don't consent to it. And I thought this was the land of the free anyways. Ha! Right. My first piece of advice above may appear to go without saying, but it's critically important if one is going to be successful. Consider it a milestone in exercising those collectivist spooks. Similarly, recall Second Realm Book on Strategy, namely number eight of Next Steps. Give up collectivist thought. 
especially asking for permission and requiring others to support you before you do anything. Recognizing and managing your controlled schizophrenia is the crucial first step in pursuing Vanu. Without it, Vanu will likely not be a lifestyle change, but rather a foray with a return to a conventional lifestyle. In summation, as Rayo said, whether one will be happier as a free man or a slave partially depends on the individual, but the choice is not open to most libertarians. Relative contentment and servitude is possible only for those who believe in it. Most libertarians are too independent and well-informed. For libertarians, the choice is between freedom and neurosis. So what's it going to be? Freedom or neurosis? <laughs>